Thanks everyone who chose to come out this evening. So for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be talking about New Jersey's Native American heritage. And I title this Archaeology in the Delaware Nations a 12,000 year odyssey because it's a story that extends back over 12,000 years and continues today. So when we study New Jersey's Native American heritage and the indigenous people who long inherited long inhabited this land, we have a number of different sources that we can draw from. Uh, they include art, archaeology, the physical remains of things that people left behind from the past, oral traditions passed down from generation to generation, historic or written documents, and experimental archaeology. Uh, and experimental archaeology is where people today try to recreate the tools and techniques of ancient societies. The image I'm showing you here uh, is uh, illustrative of a Native American creation tale, and it shows a great tree, and below it a woman on the back of a turtle. And in many Lenape or Delaware creation stories, the world is created on the back of a turtle, Lenape Hoking, the land of Lenape. And the first woman falls through the sky, landing on the back of that turtle, and there gives birth to her offspring who go on to populate North America. So it's a wonderful modern artistic interpretation of this oral tradition, this creation tale. Now, sometimes when we look at Native American art, the meanings are not immediately clear. And these are two examples. These are what we would call petroglyphs or rock carvings. Both are in the collections of the Seton Hall University Museum, and both were recovered in northwestern New Jersey near the Delaware Water Gap. Uh, the image in the upper left uh, shows a number of figures that look sort of like stick figures. Uh, some may be animals, some may be people, some may be spirit beings. Today, at least hundreds, perhaps thousands of years after they were carved, it's hard to know exactly what they represent. In the bottom right, we see another image, a pair of hands. Um, and these obviously uh, speak to the humanity of the artist. But if there was a special meaning, we don't necessarily know it today. Here's a picture of me with some of my students trying to replicate, trying to make stone tools, just like ancient Native Americans once did. And we're struggling to do this. This is experimental archaeology. And uh, one of the things we learn every time we try to do this is just how intelligent and talented our predecessors were, because this is not an easy thing to do, to flint, uh, to do flint napping and produce a projectile point. If we look across the state, um, there are reminders of our rich Native American heritage from, from High Point in the north to Cape May in the south. And this map um, by Donald Becker, published as part of uh, an atlas of New Jersey, shows some of those place names like Tuckahoe and Nummy Town, Manasquan, Wanamasa, and Sakasana. So almost wherever we go, we're reminded of New Jersey's Native American heritage. A number of different names have been used for New Jersey's native or indigenous people, the Lenape or Delaware Indians. Um, Lenape means in the Algonquin language group, people and Leni Lenape, which we also sometimes hear means real or true people. Um, another phrase that's useful is Lenape Hoking, which means the land of the Lenape. And typically we see the people who live north of the Raritan River is the Munsee while those living south of the Raritan River were the Unami. Um, if we were to travel back in time and arrive in New Jersey in, let's say, the 1400s AD, um, Native Americans would have seen themselves as members of large extended family groups, which we call, which anthropologists call bands, and they would include the Sanhican, the Raritan, and others. Delaware is a little bit more complicated. It's used by some Native American groups today. Uh, the name comes from Lord de la War, who was um, 
an English nobleman and a governor of Virginia who uh, sent uh, a voyage or sent a ship north to explore rather the Delaware, what we today call the Delaware River in the 1600s. He didn't call it the Delaware River. He, he would have called it the South River. Um, and that river gave its name uh, or took its name from Lord Delaware. And uh, today we have a state named after him in a great river. Archaeologists have been studying New Jersey's uh, earliest heritage or Native American heritage since the 1800s. And this gentleman with uh, sort of an extraordinary mustache is Charles Conrad Abbott, New Jersey's first archaeologist. And he was active in the late 1800s. And he's famous in some ways for, for being incorrect about something, but it makes him no less important. Abbott um, acquired with his wife, Julie Boggs Olden, uh, a piece of property in what today is Hamilton Township. And he had married into a wealthy family and this allowed Abbott to live a life of leisure and spend his time exploring things that he was interested in, like Native American history. Uh, and he began collecting artifacts on this property, uh, which he called the Three Beaches after three large trees that grew there. The artifacts he found reminded him of ancient artifacts also found uh, during the same time period in Europe that were known to date back tens of thousands of years to the Neanderthals. And Charles Conrad Abbott began to argue that Native Americans had been present in North America for tens of thousands of years. At the time, most scholars and scientists believed that Native Americans had only been here a few thousand years. Now, Abbott used artifacts such as these to make his argument. Uh, and these are some projectile points and stone tools that he found. Uh, the ones on the right are his finds. The ones on the left are finds that were actually made in France and other places in Europe. Uh, you'll notice that they look fairly similar. And Abbott argued that his were the same. Now, as it turns out, Abbott's finds were actually much later. But the idea that Native Americans have been present in, in North America for tens of thousands of years was a good one and an idea that today is well supported by archeological evidence. Like all great heroic figures, uh, Charles Conrad Abbott had a nemesis. Uh, his nemesis was this fellow, Alice Herdlishka, who worked for the Smithsonian Institution and who argued that Abbott was not a particularly careful excavator and that his finds were not as old as he thought they were. Uh, nevertheless, uh, while Abbott lost some battles with Herdlishka, his ideas have stuck. Other early archaeologists include Max Schrabisch, a German immigrant who is convinced that ancient Native American sites should be found in caves, rather like the cavemen of prehistoric Europe. Uh, and he spent a lot of time exploring cave sites in northwestern New Jersey, in the Poconos of Pennsylvania, and also in Orange and Rockland counties in New York. Uh, he got himself in a little bit of trouble during World War I when people called him in as a potential spy. There was a German emigre up on the mountainside taking notes and they thought he might be up to no good. Instead, he was, he was just trying to understand ancient history. Later still, Dorothy Cross, uh, becomes our state's first official archaeologist. She's hired by the New Jersey State Museum, and today Greg Latanzi is our state archaeologist. You can find him at the State Museum. She was uh, hired during the Great Depression and immediately put large crews of men, unemployed men, to work uh, excavating sites across the state and cataloging artifact collections. So she really did a wonderful job of sort of systematizing our understanding of the past and the culture history of New Jersey. Here she is. I love this. 
uh, photo of Dorothy. First of all, she's dressed up much more nicely than most archaeologists dress today. And second, she's excavating inside an enormous Native American pot, a storage vessel. So just think of the scale of that vessel that she can kneel inside it and carefully excavate. And uh, it has been lovingly restored and is on display at the State Museum in Trenton. So the culture history that Cross and Abbott and subsequent archaeologists like Herbert Kraft and Michael Stewart have put together goes essentially like this. Before about 12,000 years ago, northern New Jersey is largely covered by glaciers. It would not have been a hospitable place to live. This is the Wisconsin glaciation. And as those glaciers retreat, New Jersey becomes more and more attractive to people. The glaciers ended um, around what today would be Perth Amboy, Metuchen, Scotch Plains. That's the terminal moraine. Um, the first Native Americans in this area that we have good evidence for, we call Paleo-Indians which essentially means Native Americans or Indians from long ago. And they made really beautiful and distinctive projectile points that they used probably in hunting, but it may also have been something of a Swiss army knife used for all sorts of different purposes. Uh, sites associated with these first settlers include the Turkey Swamp site, which is now Monmouth County Park, the Plenge site up by the Delaware Water Gap, and the rather poorly named Sam's Club site uh, in Ocean County. And we think that Native Americans or the ancestors of Native Americans crossed over from Northeastern Asia across a land bridge during this period of glaciation into what is now Alaska and down into Canada, spreading out across the continental United States. However, there is increasing evidence that these early immigrants were probably also coming down the coast. And we know that there are multiple waves of immigrants from both genetics and from studies of Native American languages. And it probably happened earlier than 12,000 years ago, but in New Jersey, those are our earliest dated archeological sites. Uh, this map shows uh, about where the continental shelf ended. So we're, now I teach at Monmouth University, which is right about here, uh, and we bill ourselves as being a mile from the coast, and we are. Um, if we were to travel back to the end of the last glaciation, we'd be between 70 and 100 miles from the coast. The Hudson River had a very deep channel, came out here. Interestingly enough, archaeologists have found Native American projectile points and the remains of ancient animals like uh, mastodons and mammoths offshore while dredging. Those um, projectile points that I mentioned, they're essentially spear points that have grooves near the ends or fluted points look like this. These are examples from the Western states, but New Jersey's examples were very, very similar. Uh, here, like imagine a New Jersey that looks like this. And I know it's supposed to be cold right over, over the next couple of days, especially in New York state. But imagine if you were to go visit the Great Swamp, not very far away, right? And it would have looked like this at the end of the Pleistocene with large animals, mastodons, mammoths present there, uh, very uh, cold adapted species of trees like spruce and fir and otherwise a tundra-like environment. Archaeologists have, and paleontologists have recovered skeletons of these animals. This is uh, my favorite. This is at the Rutgers Geology Museum. This is the Mannington Mastodon. She has a wonderful name. She was found in the middle of the 19th century in Salem County, uh, put back together, uh, toured around as essentially a, kind of a circus sideshow display. Uh, you could pay a nickel to see her. And ultimately, uh, thanks, I believe, to the efforts of George Hamill Cook, uh, for whom Cook College at Rutgers is named, ended up at the Geology Museum at Rutgers. Native American sites from this earliest period in New Jersey's history are infrequent, but they do exist. And this is one of them. This is called the Fairy Hole Rock Shelter. It's in northwestern New Jersey, uh, Warren County. And here you see again, Dorothy Cross, 
with a team of remarkably happy looking excavators. I wonder what they just found uh, out in front of the ferry hole. And here is a picture I took inside looking out uh, when I was up there on a Boy Scout um, hike. So the environment shapes culture, right? And today we're having enormous debates about global warming and what will happen to our environment. Um, there's been natural global warming for a long period of time before the accelerated global warming we're almost certainly seeing today, which is due to uh, industrial processes. So that Wisconsin ice sheet starts to retreat around 15,000 years ago. The climate warms up. Spruce forest replaces tundra, then pine and oak replaces spruce. The shoreline starts to move west. And by about 2,800 years before present, roughly 3,000 years ago, a climate similar to the one we know and love had emerged. Archaeologists call a second period starting about 10,000 years ago, the archaic period. So archaeologists aren't great at naming things because the archaic period also means kind of and the old period. Uh, the archaic is different from Paleo-Indian in that we have a forested environment. So we see new types of tools like this amazing stone axe. And here are Native Americans carving out a canoe and building, making baskets and wigwams for houses. Um, new types of animals appear in larger numbers, things like the white-tailed deer that we're familiar with today. And the megafauna, those huge animals like the mastodons and the mammoths become extinct. More woodworking tools are found. This is a gouge for carving out hollow vessels. We also see other types of things showing up archeologically. Here's a soapstone bowl used for cooking in. If you have a deep sink in an older house in the basement, it may be made from soapstone. Soapstone feels a little bit like talcum powder. It's, it's fairly easy to carve. Uh, a new hunting technology appears that we call the atlatl. And this is essentially a handle that's affixed on a large dart with a weight on it. This is one of the weights, it's completely beautiful. Uh, this is also is from the Seton Hall University collection. And this handle would make even a mediocre athlete like myself, the equivalent of a major league pitcher. It gives you an incredible advantage, this lever, when throwing a dart. New projectile points, spear points show up. These were made out of the stone called argillite, quarried out near Flemington, that weathers very, very badly. So all that's left is the rough outlines of the stones. Now, one of the challenges about being an archaeologist studying New Jersey is that we don't have a lot of above ground archeological sites that you can go enjoy. Unlike say, if you were in Belize or Guatemala or Mexico or Greece or China or Africa, uh, most of ours are fairly subtle, but this is an exception. This is the Tuckerton Shell Mound. Um, and the Tuckerton Shell Mound is a mound of clam shells and oyster shells left behind by people who are camping here and eating and discarding those shells over a period of literally thousands of years. A number of archeologists have investigated it since the 19th century. I have been out. You can see the cedar trees. There's also an amazing growth of poison ivy on the Tuckerton Shell Mound. Um, and Below, just peeking out, you can see some of those shells. Interestingly enough, this is a lot like an iceberg. Down below the soil here, um, down below the marsh, there are shells going down foot after foot after foot um, that we've been able to sample. Our final period in sort of regional prehistory is what we call the woodland period, and that starts about 3,000 years ago. And People are settling down in larger communities. They're growing crops. Uh, they're making pottery. Um, and these are really the direct ancestors of the Lenape, the people that uh, Europeans will uh, discover, or rediscover, if you will, in the 15 and 1600s. And this is a reconstructed longhouse at uh, Waterloo Village, created by John. 
Uh, here is another type of dwelling that Native Americans would have used, also a recreation. Uh, this is a wigwam, also at Waterloo Village. So they're making pottery vessels, and that may not seem so special, but if you don't have pottery vessels, getting them is a game changer because it allows you to store food in new ways. It allows you to cook food and extract a lot more nutritional value from things like stews than previously would have been possible. And we see population numbers growing during the woodland period. They're also engaged, people are engaged in religious activities. Now we don't always know all the specifics, but we find artifacts that we believe relate to them. So these are very large, so I have a scale in the photo. This is a centimeter scale. These are very large, about a foot long, clay tubes that are hollow that essentially were used as tobacco pipes for smoking. So they would have been filled up with tobacco and they're called cloud blowers. And uh, the tobacco of the time was much rougher than the tobacco found in cigarettes or cigars today. So this would have been a, you know, quite an experience smoking uh, these pipes. We also know that Native Americans were trading widely and they probably were traveling quite a bit too. They weren't just settle, settled down and sedentary. So these are big, enormous, beautiful, bifacially flaked spears that are really too big to be used for any practical purpose. You can never really throw them. I mean, they're about, they're almost 10 inches long. Uh, and they're wafer thin. And if you wet them a little bit, they're incredibly colorful. They're all made out of stone from um, Ohio, but they were excavated in Bridgeport, Gloucester County, New Jersey. So they speak to long distance trade in pre-contact Native America. Other items like this raise questions. We're not entirely sure what the design we're looking at here indicates. Uh, this is an item called a gorget. Some people think you might put this in your hair to put your hair up. Other people think you might wear it as a pendant. Uh, other folks have suggested it's a bull roarer and you put it on a string and you swing it through the air and they do make noise when you do that. So we don't really know for sure, but it clearly has a pattern carved on it. And one of the questions is what does that pattern mean? Here is another gorget or pendant. This one is from uh, Ocean County. It is believed to represent a turtle. It's kind of cool. With um, growing crops, and the big three crops would have been squash. Uh, so things like pumpkins were certainly grown by Native Americans. Squash, beans, um, and corn. Though they're also growing tobacco and amaranth and other things. We have uh, grain that we need to grind up. And mortars like this one, where corn could be turned into flour, acorns, which if processed properly, could be turned into flour. Uh, don't eat acorns on your own though without processing them. That's a very bad idea. Uh, mortars like this one start to show up in archaeological collections. This one is in the collection of the Hunterdon County Library. Fishing also seems to have been important. And these large blades, which archaeologists call patalus blades, buried with a long copper pin, uh, were found at the Abbott Farm near the falls of the Delaware. And were probably used for processing big fish like this. This is an Atlantic sturgeon. Sturgeons like these used to swim up. And to some extent, they still do, though their numbers have been reduced up the major rivers of our region. So uh, thinking of uh, Somerset County, the Raritan, they would have been present in the Raritan, in the Delaware, in the Hudson Estuary. Uh, they're wonderful beasts. I mean, they look like sort of a combination of a dolphin and a crocodile. Uh, they're a lot friendlier than a crocodile. Um, and they have these bony plates on their side that show up on archaeological sites. This is a harpoon from the Abbott Farm, possibly used uh, on sturgeon like these, possibly used uh, for whales. Whales have been found coming into uh, the Delaware River. The pottery becomes really beautiful and elaborate during the late woodland period. Uh, great designs like these chevrons and these nested squares, perhaps representing different family lineages. We think that 
Uh, this pottery was primarily made by women, and it's really extraordinarily beautiful. Here is a wall of pottery at New Jersey's Prehistorical Museum, which is in Cumberland County, uh, quite a collection. Tobacco pipes also become a little bit more uh, new styles develop, as I guess what I should say. Some of them have animals on them, like this one has maybe a wolf or a dog looking back at the smoker. Some have nice incised decoration. So much more individual individuality. Now, bows and arrows are something we often associate it with Native Americans. However, bows and arrows uh, are a relatively late introduction to the Northeast. They appear to have arrived during the woodland period. These are projectile points, actual arrowheads, uh, all found in Little Silver, New Jersey, um, on either the Parker Homestead or at Sickles Market. Parker Homestead is a local historic site. We have some amazing artifacts that survive from the late woodland period. This is an exhibit at the old Barracks Museum in Trenton, a museum definitely worth visiting. And it, it's of a canoe. Uh, and this canoe was found in northern New Jersey. She's about a century ago, dredged up. Uh, it was pretty stable. The center part had been worn away and it's on display now. I was asked to date this using tree ring dating. We got a date uh, for it that was, I think, right around 1700. So the woodland period lasts until what we call a contact period, the arrival of Europeans. And this map shows the land of Lenape, Lenape Hoking, uh, sort of in a paler shade of gray with some uh, names of the bands that would have lived here. Note the Raritan uh, along the Raritan River and the Navasank in northern Monmouth County. They're going to have their first encounters with Europeans first in the 1520s when uh, Giovanni Verrazano sails up the coast, though it's not clear that he stops in New Jersey. And then again in uh, 1609, when Henry Hudson uh, sails up the coast and actually goes up the river that will come to bear his name, the Hudson River. And this is a wonderful 19th century painting, a little bit for artistic license here, showing Native Americans by the Palisades in Hudson's ship, the Half Moon. The understanding the Europeans have of New Jersey during this time period uh, is very imperfect. So this is a map from the early 1700s uh, that shows New Jersey. I love the fact that it's spelled New Jersey. Um, some people think that we New Jerseyans have accents. I know that's not true, but I love New Jersey. It sounds like pirate talk, doesn't it? And here's East New Jersey. That was West New Jersey. The coast is pretty well defined. Like we can recognize the Raritan River, which comes in in splits. We can recognize Staten Island and Manhattan Island. We can recognize Sandy Hook and Cape May. But once you get inland, it's a mystery. Right there are a couple Native American villages depicted. There's a beaver hanging out, a couple bear over here that's by New York or Pennsylvania. There's a lake here that doesn't really seem to be in the right place for Lake Apatcon. So I think this map, while wonderful, gives us kind of, uh, it's like those old New Yorker cartoons, like the New Yorker's view of the world. They sort of understand what they're seeing right in front of them, the coast, but the the explorers don't really understand much further. Uh, interactions with Native Americans during this period are, are complicated. Let me tell you a quick story. I don't want to digress too much and get too far off track, but it's a story called Between Hope and Fear that's um, that is written down in the 18 teens by a Moravian missionary, Christian missionary, living with the Delaware Indians in Ohio. And he basically asks them what their first memory is, what their, if they have any traditions of meeting Europeans. And this is their first meeting with Europeans. And this is the story they tell. Uh, they say that long ago, we lived by the coast. This is from the Lenape perspective. And one day a new 
island appeared in the ocean. And it was an amazing island. It had trees on it. It had clouds above it. There was thunder and lightning coming from it. And there were men on that island. And they were dressed very strangely. And when they talked, it sounded like dogs barking. You just couldn't make sense of it. And, and the Lenape sent out runners and they gathered around to watch this island. You can imagine if you were to go outside your house tonight and look up in the sky and you saw a new star, that would be like, wow, what is that doing there? So they gathered around and canoes left the island and brought some of these strangely dressed hard to understand people to shore. Uh, and they offered the Lenape a gourd to drink from, and they drank from it. The Lenape were concerned about this um, and did not initially partake of whatever beverage was in the gourd. But then eventually one did and passed out, much to everyone's consternation, only to be revived. And then this is folklore it's the beauty of folklore then they were able to communicate with each other so think of you know if, if only we could take take a drink of vitamin water and you could speak a foreign language wouldn't that be fabulous um so now they can communicate with each other and it turns out that their visitors are in fact dutch and the dutchmen ask if they can come back and the lenape say yes you know that'd be great uh and the dutchmen say well we'd also like a little land and i imagine the Lenape like lawyers in a courtroom doing sort of a sidebar saying like, what do we, how do we answer that? That's a strange question uh, because there's a lot of land here. Like, what do you want it for? It's ours. Well, what are you going to do with it? And the Dutch said, well, they just want a little bit for a garden and they want to mark it out. Well, the Lenape agree. And the Dutch take a little bit of land. And the story ends quite sadly, uh, with the saying that, and the Dutch came back over and over again until we had no land left at all. So that's kind of a particular perspective on these initial interactions. This is a diorama from the 1930s at the State Museum that shows Lenape leaders interacting with Europeans. And it appears that this fellow is looking rather quizzically at the gentleman who wants him to sign a document. Uh, probably a good idea to look at that quizzically. Many different, or really three different nations all coveted what would become New Jersey. The Dutch claim New Jersey is part of New Netherland. The Swedes claim part of Southern New Jersey in the 1600s, Salem County mostly, is part of New Sweden. And uh, the English also claim New Jersey as part of their larger dominion of New England. So we'll see different groups of European colonists and settlers uh, competing for ownership of what was really the Lenape's land. There are some horrific incidents during this time period. I think the uh, perhaps, and I don't want to try and characterize one is worse than another, but a particularly horrific one was a massacre of Native Americans at Pavonia. You may know the name Pavonia as a stop on the PATH train in Jersey City. Uh, Pavonia was also a Dutch patroon ship. That's like a plantation uh, with uh, an unusual name. Pavonia translates into the land of the peacock. And the Dutch governor of New Netherland, Willem Kief, uh, seen here, um, knew that a large group of Lenape had camped nearby and was seeking refuge from other Native Americans. And he dispatched Dutch soldiers uh, to kill large numbers of Lenape. And this kicked off years uh, of warfare and was really a horrific, I would say, a genocidal incident. Uh, other European leaders had better relations with Native Americans. Uh, William Penn, seen here as a young man in armor, the founder of Pennsylvania, a Quaker as an adult, um, is generally recognized as having had better relations, not perfect by any stretch, but with Native Americans. He was in some ways almost a, a progenitor to modern anthropologists. And this wampum belt displayed at the Philadelphia Museum of Art depicts uh, Penn and a Native American leader, uh, we believe, holding hands, showing that they believe they could live together in peace. I have one other story I want to digress with for just a little bit. And it shows how confusing this period, the 1600s, 
would have been for both the Native American inhabitants of New Jersey and for the new settlers. So this is a story about Richard Hartshorn. And if you go to Monmouth County, uh, there's a beautiful park called Hartshorn Woods Park. The Hartshorns are Quakers uh, from Rhode Island who relocate to New Jersey at a period when New Jersey is essentially all Native American land. Um, they owned, the Hartshorns purchased an enormous tract of land that includes all of Sandy Hook, parts of Highlands, Atlantic Highlands, Burroughs, and Middletown. And they build a house first on the Bay Shore and then a second one on the Navasink River. This map is from the 17 teens and is in the collections of the Monmouth County Historical Association. And it shows some landmarks that still exist, uh, such as Clay Pit Creek, seen here, and a number of houses. There's a house here, Davis's house, Colson's house, William Hartshorn's house, and the Beacon. The Beacon is up where Twin Lights is today, Twin Lights State Park. Um, so when Richard Hartshorn comes down to this area and starts to build a house, a group of Native Americans come out to him and interact with him and say, you're building a house for us. And he says, no, no, he's building a house for his family. And the Native Americans say, no, that doesn't really seem to be the case because you're building a house on our land. So it must be a house for us. Um, and Hartshorn's in a little bit of a quandary. And he asks the natives what he might do to solve this problem. And they say, well, you could buy the land from us, which he does. Um, now, interestingly enough, um, about a decade later, the Native Americans return with a new request. And this is a document from the 8th of August, 1698, that relates to that incident. Uh, they come back and they say to Hartshorn that when he purchased the land from them, they understood it differently than he did. Um, they thought they, they could still use the land and he would use it too. So it would be a shared resource, if you will, like a common area. Um, however, he doesn't want them there at all. Um, so if they have to leave entirely, they'd like another payment from him. And he outlines that in this document that he in fact will make another payment to them and interestingly enough, uh, it's signed at the bottom by Tokus and Vauapan, two Native Americans who've made their marks. And in the Hartshorn family papers at the Monmouth County Historical Association, this document, which is really a receipt from 1698, kind of amazing, survives. And it's a lot of fun to, I think it's a lot of fun to read it. It says, Captain Stout paid the Indians a barrel of cider for me, and I gave them a note for an anchor that's a large bottle of rum, because they should not drink it at my house, Richard Hartshorn. And then it goes on, when the Indians sold the land, though except uh, for hunting, trees for canoes, fishing, fowling, plumbing, huckleberrying, and such like, that I bought of them, and they have not pretended since to be troublesome. Richard Hartshorn. So basically, and there's some problems here, right? He's saying, yep, yep, you're right. I bought it and I'm paying you again because you, I want these rights from you. I don't want you to out there any longer. But he's also, right, and this is a problem. He's lubricating this transaction with a barrel of cider, uh, an anchor of rum, so some alcoholic beverages. However, perhaps because he's a Quaker, he does not want those beverages consumed at his house. Now we have other reminders today of, oh, and I should say with that story, the I think the important takeaway is two different societies trying to negotiate an understanding of each other from two very different uh, cultural perspectives. We do have physical reminders of this period in Native American history. This is a grave marker uh, in Hackensack, uh, the church on the green that is supposedly associated with Native Americans. You'll notice it has some unusual designs, what looks like a canoe, what appear to be arrows, what may be a peace pipe or a pipe at the top from 1713. Here is another marker for a Native American leader, Akinikin, 
uh, who died in 1681 and is buried in Burlington City. We know that Native Americans were living at a time of tremendous change and participating in two different societies. So we see kettles like this one replacing Native American pottery. And this wonderful uh, line drawing uh, by William Sotsbach, uh, a Lenape artist, shows Teddy Uscom, a Native American leader in Philadelphia. He was actually born uh, in Tom's River. He passes away in the Poconos. Uh, but he's dressed in a mix of European clothes, very fancy, and Native American ornament because he is a leader in two different societies. As the Europeans arrive in larger numbers, uh, many Native Americans moved west. Others moved to northwestern New Jersey and Pennsylvania, at what we would think of as the Poconos and Hunterdon, Warren, and Sussex counties today. Um, in the 1730s, a large quantity of land was taken, one might say stolen, from Native Americans through something called the Walking Purchase in eastern Pennsylvania. And this was uh, something perpetrated by the children of uh, William Penn on the Lenape, where a professional runner was hired to run north, northwest from Wrightstown up to about Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. Initially supposed to just go from here to the Delaware River, but he came up here and this took out, it essentially ended up ceding, the Lenape had to cede much of their land to um, two European settlers. And they were very, very unhappy about this, as you might imagine. We do have two powerful portraits of Native American leaders, Lenape leaders from this time period, Lapawinsa and Tishkahan uh, by Heselius. They're on display at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. These individuals would have um, been participants in, uh, unwilling participants, I should say, in the walking purchase. Later in the 1700s, we see missionaries making concerted efforts to convert the Lenape to Christianity, especially to um, both the Moravian and Presbyterian faiths. Some will convert, others do not. Uh, at a place called Bethel in Monroe Township, um, Presbyterian missionaries establish a town for Native American converts in the 1740s. Uh, they lived there for just over a decade. Uh, led by missionaries David and John Brainerd. Archaeologists have excavated what probably are the remains of a house there and found a tobacco pipe. A pair of treaties at Easton in Pennsylvania and Crosswicks in New Jersey uh, cede much of the remaining Lenape land in New Jersey uh, to the colonial government. In turn, uh, the Lenape will receive a land for a reservation. Uh, this is a newspaper article about the treaty in Easton. And you'll note that the governor of New Jersey and the governor of Pennsylvania have met with the eight Confederate Indian nation, the Delawares, the Unamis, the Minnesinks, the Wapis, Wappings, and the Mohicans. This is the Friends Meeting House at Crosswicks, another location where these uh, treaties were signed. The result is a reservation at a place called Brotherton uh, near Medford in Indian Mills, New Jersey. It lasts for half a century. And today it's largely, um, its site is marked by a historical marker um, as kind of the only reminder of the once powerful Native American presence. This is a great map uh, in the collections of Rutgers University Special Collections that shows the houses that were built by the colonial government of New Jersey uh, for the Native American inhabitants of this reservation. Many other Native Americans engaged in what I would call a diaspora, leaving our state for places further west. And ultimately, substantial populations of Lenape survive today in Wisconsin and in Oklahoma and some in Canada. Um, while others, of course, remain here in New Jersey. This is a house, it's a house of Indian Anne, who is a, a Native American um, who remained behind when the rest of her people 
uh, left Brotherton and headed north and then west to Wisconsin. And those communities um, are still vibrant in Oklahoma and Wisconsin. And this is a great painting by Ernest Spybuck, a Native American artist, uh, showing a religious ceremony in Oklahoma. And I love the fact that the folks in the painting are waving at us as if they're sort of saying hi to their kin here in New Jersey. Other groups of Native Americans never left the state. Um, the Sand Hill Band of Neptune Township and surrounding areas like Asbury Park are one of those. This is a family reunion from the 1940s. You might note that the, the headdresses and garb uh, are perhaps what we would think of with Plains Indians. By this time period, the 20th century, I would call the closed kind of pan-Indian reflecting Native American traditions across the continent. Whoops. So today we have the Delaware is federally recognized tribes in Oklahoma, both the Delaware tribe of Indians and the Delaware nation, uh, and the Stockbridge Muncie in Wisconsin, there are also state recognized tribes like the Nanticoke, Lenny Lenape, the Ramapo, uh, Northeastern New Jersey, the Powhatan, Renape, um, and as I mentioned a, a moment ago, the Sand Hill Band in Monmouth County. So New Jersey has this incredible, but I think often overlooked Native American heritage that goes back at least 12,000 years and continues today. Uh, this is a photo taken. Uh, at a powwow in the state, and it speaks to the vibrancy even today of Native American culture, which continues to shape our state uh, into the 21st century. So thank you so much for being a great audience this evening. And um, if folks want to put questions in the chat, uh, I'd be happy to, to answer them. And I have my email here if you have other questions. And the Archaeological Society of New Jersey is a great place to learn more, too. So I'm going to stop, uh, stop sharing the screen for now.